In a country where bustling cities are the centers of the universe for millions of people, more of the actual landmass of the United States of America looks like this. And when millions in the cities leave to escape and reconnect with the natural world, the forests, deserts, and coastlines of places like our national parks become crowded themselves. As a civilization, we seem to find something we perhaps misidentify as comfort in numbers. But here, comfort isn't so easy to find. East of the Rocky Mountains, the ground levels and sprawls into a region of America called the Southern Great Plains. It's a mix of small towns, some forgotten and dying, long, lonely stretches of highway, and a raw beauty captured in several national grassland reserves. Like most adventures we set out on, the places we're drawn to film become secondary to the discovery of things we didn't know existed. It's pretty incredible to actually walk around and see what's left. This journey through the heartland delivered us to wide open spaces far from the buzz of big cities. We're like in the middle of nowhere and it feels good. It is definitely a place I never thought I'd go back to anytime soon, ever and revealed a site where clues of a painful chapter in American history tell a difficult story. When World War II finished, they, the US government basically abandoned this place. We didn't know what to fully expect choosing a place to explore so far from the country's top outdoor destinations. But what we found was true solitude, dramatic landscapes, and a better understanding of a place that, until now, we've never really known. When you travel, the world becomes a smaller place. When you explore with friends that share a love of photography, destinations come to life. We tell the stories of travel with our cameras, capturing some of the most beautiful locations on Earth. But every adventure reveals more than what's in the frame. The people, the food, and unexpected turns of the journey bring the full experience of travel into focus. Production funding for Outside Beyond the Lens provided by the Fresno Clovis Convention and Visitors Bureau. Nature, diversity, found in the heart of California's San Joaquin Valley. Fresno County, an outside year-round playground. By Gar Tatillion, crop care advice, products, and services. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By BK Lighting and Tekka Illumination, helping brighten the world with custom landscape and architectural lighting solutions. By integrated agribusiness professionals, members building healthy families and communities to feed your heart and soul. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for 50 years, proud to support outside beyond the lens and the wonders of travel. And by viewers like you, of America that's been forgotten. Actually, a better description would be a side of America most have never known. It's an area that missed its calling. A place where economic promise and hope were once whispered, but could never really take hold in the unforgiving winds of the Southern Great Plains. It's also a strange place to shoot a TV show about travel and photography. Or is it? We found ourselves in this part of the country where southeastern Colorado and the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas all converge on our way back to Denver after shooting our storm chasing episode in May of 2019. 
We did some research at the hotel one night and saw several national grasslands on the map on our route back to the airport. So we decided to use the extra days we had to explore this remote part of America to better understand and appreciate what this place is really like. And isn't that what travel is supposed to be about? Our road trip into the unknown began just outside the small town of Stratford, Texas, in the northernmost section of the Texas Panhandle, where the Rita Blanca National Grasslands is found. In some ways, a shoot like this is more interesting than when we hit a big national park or other travel hotspot. Everything we see is content. Every image documents the essence of this journey. It's too easy to just sit in the car and watch it all pass by. For us, in a place like this, even the smallest subjects tell a larger story of what the grasslands are like. The pavement has just turned to dirt on a lonely, straight road through a national grasslands called Rita Blanca National Grasslands, which is in the very top left corner of the Texas Panhandle. Oklahoma Panhandle meets it right up here, New Mexico border straight ahead. Uh, the national grasslands protected areas in the United States are sort of overlooked. They're not, they're, they don't get all the press, they don't get all the uh, attention of like the national parks or even state parks. But grasslands are very important places to, to protect and to visit so you remember and know and appreciate what these lands look like before they were you know, turned into agricultural land or grazing lands. So we're gonna take this drive. We really have no plan. We really don't know exactly where this leads. The, the thing with this grasslands that we're in right now, this Rita Blanca, is that it's a shared area. So there is a mixture of farmland, uh, private farmland mixed with National Forest Service lands that are protected. And so we're gonna kinda go in and out of this. We're seeing some, looks like some dry wheat cropping over here. We've seen a lot of beef cattle operation going on. Um, so as we get further into it, we'll see. But right now we're on a straight, long dirt road headed due west for the New Mexico border. The protected grasslands in this part of the country are all here because of what happened in the 1930s. This was ground zero for an event in American history called the Dust Bowl. Severe drought struck hard in the Southern Plains from 1934 through 1940. Not fully understanding the ecology of the plains, farmers deep plowed these lands, damaging native grasses that held the dusty topsoil and moisture in place. This unanchored soil turned to dust and the strong prevailing winds fueled by the drought created huge dust storms that covered everything and turned the skies black. Some of these dust storms were so massive, they reached Washington, D.C. and New York City. 100 million acres of land were affected by the Dust Bowl, and poverty-stricken families, unable to live off their crops, fled these fields. Many headed west. The federal government bought back much of the failed cropland and redesignated it into protected grasslands after much of this landscape returned to the native grasses and ecology that once flourished here in balance with everything else. Digging this weather? I'm digging this weather, I'm loving it. Loving the temperature, a nice breeze going. It's been warm and muggy the last few days, so yeah, it's a nice change. We're out kind of out here in the literal middle of nowhere. It's something peaceful about it. it right? It, feel, it feels peaceful out here. It's just, you just feel, whew, we're like in the middle of nowhere and it feels good. It's just a calm, the, the, these grasslands are just rolling and sweeping. There's, uh, there's, there's, you know, open land, there's, um, there's barbed wire fencing and there's obviously some ranching going on, but every once in a while you just get these wide open stretches. Oh, it's beautiful. 
As we push further west into Rita Blanca National Grasslands, we leave the fringes of agricultural areas behind and get into the heart of what this place is all about. Here, in the middle of nearly 100,000 acres of native grasslands, we see our first glimpse of the larger wildlife that calls these distant fields home, the pronghorn. Typically, pronghorn are very skittish and will bolt if vehicles approach. And since we decided to shoot this episode as an afterthought to the storm chasing show, we didn't have all of our really long lenses to help bring these guys in for a closer look. So it's time to see what we can see with the drone. Pronghorn are one of the fastest land animals in North America, and even trying to track them with a drone that can fly nearly 50 miles an hour is difficult. It's also not my favorite thing to do to chase animals with a drone. They can get stressed or injured running away. So after a quick shot over a mile away from our position, I hit a button on the bird to bring it home. Trying to find the antelope in this flat light on this, in these conditions, lighting and grass wise was hard. And then luckily they just sort of ran under my drone out of nowhere. So I did follow them for a little bit, uh, but, uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time like chasing them all over the uh, all over the grasslands because you don't want to stress them out or anything like that. I did want people to see him, see him run and see him moving and see the environment a little bit. So we got the shot. We're done. I'm gonna pack it up. Keep on moving. Even though this isn't the kind of place people would typically spend a great deal of effort or expense to visit, we are all really digging this drive. Anytime you can just experience a section of land especially in the middle of the United States, that is totally raw and wild, it makes an impact on you. It's easy to slip into imagination and relive what life was like out here for those brave and hardy enough to start a home on the plains. And as we near the New Mexico border, ruins of those homesteads come into view the last reminder of the mass exodus caused by the Dust Bowl. Monuments to shattered dreams. No, no, that, no, that's a two-story, that's a big farmhouse. Let's go, let's see if we can go down there. There's a place here, maybe they'll let us, uh, let's see, let's just cruise down there and see what that's all about. Oh, we gotta go check this out. That place is wild. It doesn't look I, it looks super abandoned to me. It looks like the Wicked Witch of the East's it it shoes are going to be sticking out of the bottom of it. It's abandoned. totally abandoned, you guys. Can I jump out and grab some shots? Yeah. yeah. See that. I mean, I'm no expert on construction or telling how old something's been here, but I'm going to say 40s, maybe. Just looking at the what they did for the foundation, what I've seen before, the concrete, some of the stuff laying around the laying around the bottom here. And from a photography standpoint, it's like a dream. <laughs> Pretty easy to get lockjaw around here. Um, look what they did here. This place, it had the old shiplap siding, and then they put like composite siding over the top of it that looks like 50s maybe, I'm thinking now. Looks like they, someone tried to redo this thing. Let's get a look. Maybe we can watch your stuff though. No, I don't want to see, like right there. Like that's a rusty nail sticking right up. Yeah. Yeah. There's no urgent care around here, unfortunately. Walk around and check this out. It's really, when you go where John is, you can see inside there's an old pair of cowboy boots with a hole in it. Whoa. Yeah. No, well, they just walked away one day. I don't know, it makes you wonder. Whenever you see these old places, what, who lived here? What was their lives like out here in the middle of the northern Texas panhandle? Their farming out here. 
There's remnants of their operation, how they live their lives. Now it's just sort of left to the, uh, the winds of the southern plains of Texas here. With daylight fading, we make our way further west towards the New Mexico border and the small town of Clayton, where we'll be staying for the night. We pass house after abandoned house on the high Texas plains, icons to a tough time in American history and the high hopes these fields once held. After a restful night in Clayton, we're back on the road headed north through the Oklahoma Panhandle on our way to Colorado. The plan today is to investigate another national grassland area about two hours away. But before we do, I've seen something else on the map I want to check out. A place that marks a dark chapter in American history that now sits quiet on the windy high plains of southeastern Colorado. On December 7, 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack on the U.S. Navy at Pearl Harbor, officially pulling America into World War II. Not long after the attack, military officials drew up a plan to round up and imprison nearly 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, including legal U.S. citizens on the West Coast. Fearful that this population was sympathetic to Japan and could launch attacks from within. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. And for the first time in U.S. history, fear became stronger than justice. The constitutional rights of these citizens were stripped away and they were forced into makeshift camps located at 10 locations across the country. One of these locations was called Camp Amache, the Granada War Relocation Center. And by the fall of 1942, this place wrongfully imprisoned over 7,000 Japanese Americans. Most were US citizens. Their only crime, being born with Japanese blood in their veins during a time of war. There's really good interp signs here too. Yeah, there's good interp signs everywhere. And everywhere you're seeing is actually, there's foundations in this grass and then in, the, in this foliage, there's there's found, every, I mean, every, there's only separated by maybe six feet too. If you walk through there, you're gonna be on pads constantly. Here's the site of the Amache High School. Uh, they actually had their own, they had, they had their own school. They, they kind of, the Japanese that were here that were put in these camps were very, Proud still of their country. They were very, very, they were hurt by what happened to them, but very, many of them were very loyal still. The Granada War Relocation Center was designed much like the other nine prisons the U.S. government built to contain the 120,000 Japanese American internees from the West Coast during World War II. Here on the high plains of Colorado, just a few miles from the Kansas border, signs of the prison still remain the concrete foundations of the barracks that housed families, the footprint of the mess hall they would all gather to eat, and the guard towers where soldiers armed with machine guns stood sentry over proud and patriotic Americans who had done nothing wrong. It's pretty incredible to actually walk around and see what's left, the old foundations, and just checking it all out and imagining kind of how it was, you know, back then. You can still even, I'm finding cans and, you know, simple things that belonged to them back back then, you know, out in these fields. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Of the 10 relocation centers that were built in 1942, I've been to six of the actual sites. The most famous and well-maintained is Manzanar on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. 
but Amache would be a close second for me with regards to the level of interpretive signs and reconstruction of certain buildings, along with a well-preserved amount of actual camp layout. By the end of the war, these camps were empty. The government slowly lost interest in imprisoning its own population as it became clear the U.S. would be victorious in the Pacific and Europe. And in an example of painful irony, no person of Japanese ancestry was ever convicted of espionage or sabotage during World War II. In contrast, between 1942 and 1944, 18 Caucasians were tried for spying for Japan. 10 were convicted. With our road trip back to Denver almost wrapped up, we decide to make one more stop near La Junta, Colorado at the Comanche National Grasslands. As we move further west and begin to climb towards the Rockies, the endless sea of the flattened grass of the southern plains gives way to rolling hills, mesas, and distant canyons. At nearly 500,000 acres, Comanche National Grasslands is a wide open playground of discovery, and for us, landscape photography. But the main draw to this area is something we are now headed for. Far off in the back of the grasslands is 400 foot deep Picket Wire Canyon. In the bottom of the canyon, Purgatory Creek has slowly cut this valley into the earth, and as proof of this long and patient sculpture of bedrock, one of the largest dinosaur trackways in the world is found. Over 1,300 tracks of Brontosaurus and Allosaurus dinos from 150 million years ago are fossilized in the bedrock the river has exposed over time. But getting back here and then finding this spot is going to take some work. I think one of the overlooked draws to a place like this is just how wide open and accessible it is. But because the roads aren't paved and your mobile phone may not work, the crowds are almost non-existent. From the satellite images we looked at, we knew to aim for this campground and parking area, and it looks like we found it, along with a trailhead and some not so good news. So what happened was we didn't properly research this site. Parenthetically, I didn't properly research this site. Um, so looking at the map and trying to understand this, um, the track site, which has 1,300 or so dinosaur tracks from the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago, which sounds really cool, from this position, one way is a six-mile hike. So if you do drive in here, you're going to be walking for the day to see the tracks. That's unfortunate for us as we were really looking forward to seeing that. With more time to spare and a little bit better planning, this would have been a fun way to spend the day. From the edge of the mesa, looking down into Purgatory Creek, the dinosaur track site is barely visible in the distance. Even though we missed the mark on the dinosaur tracks, Exploring Comanche National Grasslands was worth the extra drive off the interstate to see. These wild, wide open stretches of America are mostly unknown to those of us who live here and way off the to-do list for international travelers in search of the superstar national parks the United States is famous for. But these places should be visited more especially for those who live in big, crowded, and congested cities. It's too easy to become a prisoner in the environment you grind away at life in. It can narrow your field of view too much. For us, travel has always been about perspective, seeing how another part of the world lives or exists, so you better appreciate where you are now. Yes, we come here to photograph and film these locations as part of that learning, but something very real and healing can happen when you come to a place as open and quiet as this. The first step is making the effort to come here. 
but the payoff happens when you can actually stop for just a moment and let it in. Production funding for Outside Beyond the Lens provided by the Fresno Clovis Convention and Visitors Bureau. Nature, diversity, found in the heart of California's San Joaquin Valley, Fresno County, an outside year-round playground. By Gar Tatillion, crop care advice, products, and services. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By BK Lighting and Tekka Illumination, helping brighten the world with custom landscape and architectural lighting solutions. By integrated agribusiness professionals, members building healthy families and communities to feed your heart and soul. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for 50 years, proud to support outside beyond the lens and the wonders of travel. And by viewers like you, 